Thank you. This. Can everyone hear me all right? Good. I tend to be loud anyway, so that's always fun. All right. So, how, got a couple quick polls for you. How many have seen the initial contextual jQuery video from 2010 or the one from the jQuery UK? Has anyone watched that? Just a few. All right. That's fine. That works out great because I'm going to give you a little review. We're going to talk about some really fun things today. Uh, my goal anytime I get up to talk is to give you uh, uh, ammo to go back to your jobs on Monday um, and have something that you can integrate into your work right away. So hopefully everyone here learns something today or thinks about something different or maybe approaches a project slightly different because of, of the talk today. All right, so the contextual jQuery series, um, there's a video for the most updated version of the first part, which is at jQuery UK. That's uh, bit.ly contextual one. Don't worry too much about typing all these down. I'll post the slides afterwards and tweet them out. Uh, contextual jQuery in practice was back in Boston last year, and that kind of went in a little bit more detail. That overlaps, overlaps the most with what I'm going to cover today. And then the, the third part in this series is just in time, uh, basically initialization and then user action. So that's what we're going to cover today. Contextual jQuery is a term that I coined and it's, it kind of describes a, a way to approach jQuery projects that solves a number of problems. One of the problems it solves is that everything's ready in DOM ready. And this is a, uh, you see this especially as people are getting started with jQuery or you're working on a multi-page site that keeps growing, keeps growing, don't have a ton of structure there yet. Pretty soon you get this kind of concept where, oh, I got to initialize all my dialogues. Uh, maybe I'm going to set up a contact form. Don't worry about parsing this too much. I'll point out code when, when it's super relevant. Maybe it'll make some AJAX requests and then you see my comment that does say 100 lines of more code like this. And basically the concept is that you want to make sure every part of that page is ready all the time, any time that person's on that page. And, and we'll learn here just in a few minutes that's a little inefficient. The other one is finding and initializing just too many elements. So there's 1,200 items in this, this list of this overzealous customer of yours, uh, and they're all drag and drop pieces that you're going to have an interface for. Well, that's, that's a lot of items to initialize when they're really only going to drag and drop three or four items in that session. Uh, maybe another one is you have some special hijacking you're doing and you're trying to bind to every single uh, element anchor on the, on the page. In this particular case, the way this code is written, it would go and find all those elements and, and create separate events for them. Again, not tremendously efficient. Uh, social widgets, uh, social widgets are like the worst kill for performance and trying to get things to load well. And even video widgets and other pieces that people put on your page that you don't have a ton of control over. Uh, those things are, are highly inefficient at times and can really hurt performance. So you take the situation where you have 10 articles and five share widgets on each one. If you just go with the concept, I'm going to make everything ready all the time, you're going to have all of those widgets loading. And that's just a ton of bandwidth, DNS requests, and other things that are going to slow your page down. Um, all right, another one that we might not think about much, you've heard of require systems and build systems and ways to offset this, but just not even something that complicated. Just kind of think about when you have large chunks of functionality that have limited use. So when the, there's an unbalanced bandwidth, amount of stuff you're downloading, maybe even the amount of stuff you're running, to usefulness ratio. So say you have a, an awesome startup and you launch your, your website and every single page has a sign up form at the bottom for your new service. Well, along with that sign up form is you have the latest and greatest it automatically determines if your username is ready to go, if it's already taken, if that email address is already signed up and you have that stuff running on every single time the page loads regardless of if someone's just browsing your site looking to learn more information. Um, that's a situation where you have an unbalanced amount of code. You have validation libraries, you have code, maybe you're even using something like uh, Amplify Request to abstract your AJAX request. You're loading all of this stuff to manage a, a piece of the page that they're going to rarely use. You know, want them to use it, um, but a lot of times it's going to be slowing down your site for no reason. Um, another example I gave here is a contact dialog. And when you open the dialog, there's a map, right, of your, of your town. You would never want to initialize that prior to showing it uh, because that's just a waste, especially if it shows up on every page. All right, so all of these share a common issue. And a common issue is that they're willing to sacrifice load time, waste memory, and often waste bandwidth to handle the fear that everything is ready to go at any particular time when a user would, would go to interact with it. Now, you would never do this in real life. And if you've seen the video, uh, any of the stuff that I've done before, this is my the favorite saying, is to write code like you spend money. And if you were anticipating this year going to 15 conferences, or not, not attending 15 conferences, say you found 15 conferences that looked interesting to you, uh, you wouldn't go buy the early bird ticket to all 15 conferences 
and then decide which two you're going to. Right? That would be a complete waste of money. It would be foolish, and everyone would be laughing at you. Well, we do that with code. We load bunches and bunches of code. We run tons of stuff. We initialize all these things, when in reality, most users are not going to use every part of a page all the time, every time they're there. It's just unlikely. It's, it's highly unlikely. And so what contextual jQuery tries to get you to do is to focus your efforts on what you anticipate the user is going to be doing, what they might need to in interface with, and kind of get those things ready at that point. So you have very fast load times, um, but stuff still works. So just again, a lot of this is summary. Um, the videos that are available that will be in the slide notes, those will cover some of this in greater detail, just so we can get to our core topic today. Um, a couple things that are handled. We suggest moving anything that's like hide, show, any visual stuff that you're running in document ready just to get the page to look right should really be moved to CSS. Um, anything you can possibly do, you can use JS, no JS classes, you can use any number of things to move a lot of that to the CSS. So you're not running that stuff, with, running that um, showing and hiding with JavaScript. That will speed up some things. Streamline your document ready calls. Make, their, make sure there's less selectors, uh, fewer selectors, and less initialization. Um, again, you're a little going to be a little scared. We're going to talk about how to initialize that stuff later. That's what the topic is today. But you want to really get a, as much of that as your document ready as possible. Leverage delegated events. If you're not using those to the best of your ability, you're really missing out because it can really give you some great improvements because no selection has to run for those to be bound and ready to go. Uh, whereas most events, traditional event binding, you're having to find the items first, so that takes time, and then actually go ahead and, and make the, um, the binding. Um, again, one of, the, one of the parts of contextual jQuery is coming up with your own HTML conventions, things that you will follow throughout your website. They can change from project to project, but throughout your website, you're going to follow these conventions, and you can use those conventions to make highly reusable code um, that leverages a lot of these other benefits. And finally, you're, instead of thinking of the page as this massive blob that you have to get all ready at the same time, you start to focus on individual components and how a user might interact with those and what would be triggers to indicate that they're planning to do something else that you can then make sure is ready to go for them. And this goes beyond just saving time. This goes to, to ahead and even you can even start loading stuff ahead of time before they request it um, to speed up the perceived um, speed of your site. So you can use this in not just this micro-optimization way, but also in general pieces across your site. So we've solved these amazing problems by following this thing called contextual jQuery, which, you know, summarizing today, not going too much into detail. But I, it introduces new problems. So whereas once everything was ready to go all the time, now we have a situation where a very real risk is that a user will go to interact with a portion of your page that while the page loaded quickly, that component is not ready to go. And so they have a bad user experience because they can't, they can't you know, manage the carousel or they can't sign up for your product. I mean, that would be devastating. Um, so the other one is the user may be forced to wait. If you've waited to, remote, to load some remote content, they may be forced to wait while you work um, on getting that solved quickly because you were trying to save time in the beginning. So that's what we're going to focus on. Excuse me. That's what we're going to focus on today. And it's really a simple fix. All you have to do is anticipate what the user is going to do and, and do it. Right? That's pretty simple. All right. So it's not a simple fix. It's an easy to understand fix, but not exactly a simple fix. Good news is you don't have to be a psychic. This, your users are giving you information all the time about what they're doing on your site. I'm not talking about metrics, about analytics, just simple stuff that they're doing that you can pick up on. Every time an event fires from user interaction, they're providing feedback to your code about what's happening and maybe even what they're about to do. So you have that feedback mechanism all the time. And maybe you've not thought of it in that respect, but that was really the user communicating with your code, giving indication about what they're about to do. It's the turning signal on a car that people fail to use, you know, but um, that type of thing where they're, they're sending these signals or giving these events about what's happening on the page. And even the pages themselves, if you just think about this in a larger context, the pages themselves can indicate what the user's about to do next. And you can start optimizing for that situation so you're almost anticipating their needs. Um, so the interaction points that they're going to come up with, oh, there's a number of them, and there's probably more than just this list. Um, but obviously, a click or a tap, it's obvious. You know, we know that they're interacting with a page, and we can respond to that. Um, mouse enter, mouse leave. This is great when you're dealing with desktop applications. Obviously, it has no application in touch devices at all. So um, if you're building a responsive site, this will have limited use for you. Another one we're going to talk about briefly uh, is mount at, mouse enter, mouse leave, but with a delay. So you kind of can tell when they're over an element, but you wait to interact with it until you know, they've been there a certain amount of time to kind of gauge how, how actually important they're going to 
find that part of the page. Uh, focus and blur, this is one of my favorite. This one's really neat, and it's one I think you'll find interesting when we get to that. Uh, scrolling's another one you find leverage quite a bit. It can be very bad if done wrong, but you know, there's definitely has usefulness. Uh, typing's another indicator that they're doing something on your page, and you can kind of anticipate based on not what they're typing, but the fact that they're typing this part of your page, what they're going to do next. Uh, and then finally, the resizing. Um, that happens when they resize the browser, and you have a responsive design, or when they change orientation on their device, that type of concept. You can respond to those type of events. So let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. Click and tap. All right, this is the most obvious form of determining user intent. They basically have just screamed at you, I want to do this. And they click there, or they tap there, and they give that indication. So the action's definite. This is definitely your most foolproof way of indicating what a user wants to do. If they click contact us, you know what they want to do? Probably contact you or find your phone number or get to that page, but you know that that's where they want to go. They've just been very clear about it. However, if what they've clicked on depends on external content, by the time they click, it's too late, right? They're going to have to wait now for that content to load, and hopefully you're showing some indication that that's happening. But again, it's too late to, it's not really anticipating it. It's too late to catch up. Um, so this is a great fit with local content that involve complex setup tasks. Um, so maybe getting a bunch of dialogues ready to go. Instead of setting them all up right away, you can wait until they click on the button. That happens very quickly, but you can move it out of document ready and just into when you need it. If you um, do tend to use it with remote actions, and we'll talk about safeguards here in a bit, where this is kind of a safety net, then you do want to make sure you have loading indicators ready to provide the um, feedback to the user that they're not waiting indefinitely for something to happen. There's, you know, you're aware that they're waiting. All right, some tips really quickly here. When you're dealing with a click and tap events, um, depending on what you're developing for, always delegate this method, almost always. I, there's always exceptions. In everything I covered today, there's going to be exceptions. There's going to be things you find that don't work quite right and need to be done differently. Um, but this is a great one to delegate and just take away that initial selection. And instead, bind it to a, a, a delegated event and let that fire when they interact with your page. Uh, kind of treat this like the first step in a wizard. So if they're clicking on an a, uh, item to show a dialogue, well, the very next step that they're about to see is a dialogue. So set that up and make sure everything's ready to go there. Now, again, if they click on um, something that's going to toggle and show content, if that content that they're showing has a bunch of social widgets or has a bunch of stuff that could be potentially slow to page load, don't show it until they go to show the content. And then you can go ahead and load that for them. All right, mouse enter and mouse leave. Um, these ones are fun, but again, have limited use on, on mobile devices, uh, unless they have a, a mouse um, feedback mechanism on the device. Um, the action has high probability, but again, it has a lot of false positives. So just the fact that they move the mouse over an element doesn't mean they want to interact with it. It just could be they're getting on their way to where they're going, uh, and their mouse happened to, to hand, uh, kind of go over the element. It's definitely more expensive to listen for, especially if you're delegating the event, because Every element in that area is going to be triggering this and testing against it. Um, so this one has a little bit more limited usefulness. It works great for drag and drop implementations that we mentioned earlier. You don't want to initialize 1,000 elements if they're going to only interact with three. Um, so that's a great implementation for it. Um, but again, I already mentioned it's useless on touch devices. So let's look at this example really quickly. Nice short example, document ready. I have div.item, and I'm going to call draggable on it. Right? Well, if I have 1,000 items, that's in. It's got to find all those items. It's got to set those things all up. It's going to increase the memory footprint. And um, again, we're just spending tons and tons of money, tons of code um, that we don't know the user is actually going to need to use. Um, so one way we could refactor this is to delegate on mouse enter to the document. Again, I'll explain in a second why you would want to do something slightly different. But just to give it a quick example, this is delegating the event. It's going to find any item, uh, any div with a class of item, that it does not have a class of UI draggable. We don't want to double initialize these things. But if it doesn't have a class of UI draggable, we're going to go ahead and set this up. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'm going to cover one-time initialization patterns like I'm using here, so you can avoid double initialization. So what this ends up doing is when UI, jQuery UI draggable is set up, it adds a class automatically to the element. So this will only trigger on the first mouse enter of an element that is not yet draggable. It will set itself up. And in future, it won't trigger this event. Now, a couple tips. Oh, here, you know what? I have an example. I forgot about that. All right, so uh, if you've been on TechCrunch's site, they've changed this in the last couple months a little bit. Not the design, but how they interact with this particular widget. But you see the social widgets right there? Um, those aren't actually interactive widgets yet. They're just, they're just little uh, pictures or indications of what, what could be there. 
for the longest time, if you moused over any part of the article, that would immediately convert to uh, the social widgets. So what they said was, if they mouse over any part of this article, uh, they, they're probably going to want to share it. I'll set this stuff up. The problem was, if you were scrolling down the page and your mouse was in the middle and you were kind of moving around, it was just setting up all these widgets. So it's not necessarily the most efficient. So what they've done is they've made it so now, if you only mouse over that area of the social widgets, then it loads in the social widgets. So they've been able to have all those things that they wanted on their page show 10, 15, 20 articles without the performance hit of loading in all of those social widgets right away. So they're implementing something very similar to what we're talking about today. Couple tips. When you do delegate something that has anything to do with mouse events, delegation you can choose what is that the top level container that actually has the event that's listening for its children. Try to get that as close to the items that are affected by it as possible. For instance, if all those div items were inside of a UL, go ahead and make that extra expense of finding that UL to start and delegate against that element. So you're not delegating against, you're not binding to a thousand elements, but you are delegating to its parent. That way there's very, there's a lot less events bubbling up that have to fail that test. Um, so you can optimize that way. Um, and then again, this is kind of like your last resort. If you can't use any of the other events and triggers we're talking about today, then maybe mouse enter is the right one for you, but there's some of the other ones are going to be better and more performant. So keep that in mind. All right, mouse enter, mouse leave with a delay. This one's a little better. How many of you use hover intent on a, on a website? Hover intent? Okay. That's basically what we're talking about. We're gonna, I'm going to give an example that's a little bit more in-depth than hover intent. Uh, but the concept is you're, you're going to say, all right, mouse enter, mouse leave indicates you're about to interact with this component. Maybe I should set it up. But you're going to wait just a little bit for them to find out if they're actually hanging there or they're just moving across the page somewhere else. It has less false positives, which is great. Um, and that increases the probability even more. One thing I noticed, the third point here, requires a click safety net. If they move over something like, say, those widgets, and they're just sitting there waiting for you to initialize, and they start clicking on the Twitter one, um, you want to try to have a backup plan that would work really well so when you're optimizing, um, you don't totally break the experience for the user. Um, hover intent works, but again, right now, currently, you still have to find. I think, there's a, I think there might be a beta that has some delegation involved. But I use J um, Ben Allman's Do Timeout plugin. It's awesome for managing um, this type of advanced timing situation. Um, and I'll, um, I'll, when I post the slides, I'll also put some notes at the end. And I have, I have side examples of what that might look like. Um, but it's, again, you're basically saying, all right, hey, they just moused over. In 500 milliseconds, if they haven't left, I'm going to go ahead and set this up. And you have another way to cancel and another way to fire it immediately if they click. And you have basically all of your options tied up in just a few lines of code. So it works out really well. All right, scrolling. This action has medium probability. So it's not really high probability because the fact that they're scrolling uh, doesn't necessarily indicate that they want to interact with that part of the page. However, what it does do is it very clearly de describes what they can't interact with. So if they're at the top of your site and you have this awesome footer widget with 50 million options, they cannot interact with it until they're toward the bottom of the site. So what it does do is it does narrow the field of what exactly can be used at that time. So you can leverage this information to avoid setting up that crazy awesome footer that your CEO wanted uh, until they're getting close to maybe 75% down the page, and then you can set it up. And again, that type of calculation um, shouldn't be communicate. This shouldn't happen on every single scroll event. Um, that is a really bad way to kill your performance. Um, but you can do some of this stuff by getting it ahead of time, getting information from the elements you need, and then determining when they're about to scroll into view. Uh, if that sounds a little too complicated, there are plugins that help you with this. jQuery Waypoints and jQuery Sonar are two examples. Um, that help you with figuring out when stuff is coming into view. A couple tips. Work with that cache comparison data. You don't want to be calling offset on an element on every single scroll down the page. You just kill the performance. Um, and it was definitely not the type of thing that would even be remotely helpful to what we're talking about today. Um, so what you'd want to do is find out maybe on DOM ready, you'll do one request to find out where that element is on the page. Or maybe you'll wait just a little bit and figure out where that element is or how tall the page is. You can do it it's a number of different ways. And then finding the scroll top from the window is very inexpensive. So you just compare one number against another number and determine what to do from there. So um, if you are working with some more advanced stuff where you do need to kind of find information while you're scrolling, uh, then you're going to want to throttle or debounce that. Uh, yesterday, I think it was um, either Menno or Elijah, I don't remember, covered throttle and debounce plugin from Ben Allman. That's great. If you're already using underscore, it also has those methods, and you can use that as well. Um, so depending on what I'm doing with a project, I'll use one or the other. 
All right, this one's the most fun, because I think this is the one that kind of slips our mind, and we don't think about as much. Maybe you've thought about some of these other ones in some form or fashion. But have you thought about the fact that form validation doesn't matter if they don't use your form? And you can tell when they're using your form because they interact with the form elements. It's really, really straightforward. Um, so I mean, your simple validation, which is don't send an empty form, go ahead and set up at the beginning. But all your advanced stuff, like you need to have an email address, it needs to work this way, you need to have a username that I'm going to validate against the server. None of those things matter until they've actually started interacting with your form. So you can actually listen to the focus event, um, which is actually, if you're delegating it, it's focus in and focus out um, to work around some uh, event bubbling bugs in some browsers. Uh, but it's focus in and focus out when you're using delegated events. And again, when I'm saying delegated, you can use on, and you're using it using this, uh, the second parameter that gives you the what element you're listening for. Um, so this is great for if you're initializing autocomplete, maybe you wanting to get stuff from the server that's going to populate that at one time. Um, date pickers, validations, any, any part of a uh, form that you need to interact with first to submit, those are all great times to set that stuff up. Um, again, you find these type of wastes happen when stuff starts to be on every page of the site. But again, there's no reason you can't, if you're starting to think about it differently, interact with these things on even pages that just have one form. All right, this one's fun. Um, this one's a little less useful than the input. Basically, by the time they focus on a form and they, they're in that form, unless you're just tabbing through your page, um, chances are they're going to interact with it. So I'd almost say the focus one's more useful. Um, but this would be good. And say you had a multi-step wizard. Uh, and it's going to be four or five steps. And they have to fill in the first step to get to the second step. Well, you can render that page without all those other components there, not even trying to request the AJAX ahead of time, until they enter into one of your fields and start typing. At that point, they're basically just screamed at you, I'm going to be using this form. You might as well get the next pieces of it. So at that point, when you have they started interacting, started typing on that form element, you can start to load in the additional pages of that wizard to make sure everything's ready to go. So now you've really balanced your cost benefit to make sure the user has what they need, but that they're getting the fastest experience in the meantime. All right, so resize really comes into play when you're working with responsive designs, uh, where the functionality depends on the available screen size. Um, so we're working on a project currently at Append2 where um, at a certain breakpoint, they have this really interactive video player. And as soon as you hit around 600 pixels, 700 pixels, somewhere in there, uh, I think it's like 670. You know how breakpoints work? You break it where the design breaks. Um, it switches to not having that much of rich interactivity. So if they loaded it on, say, a Kindle Fire, and they loaded it in a vertical orientation, I wouldn't want to go ahead and set up that rich video player with the hope that they might turn the device sideways. That wouldn't really make sense. I might just not set that stuff up just yet. I could determine, though, when they did rotate their device, and all of a sudden, now they're getting a different layout that has that player in it, that at that point, I could spend that money, again, of interacting with that and setting up the widget. So resize works well for there. Again, if you're doing it a lot, or you're doing anything expensive, any expensive calculations in that callback, make sure you throttle or debounce it, um, and those things just to, to mitigate those issues. All right, so here's, the, here's the, the, the crux of all of this. I've just given you a bunch of uh, indicators, but how do you use them? Which one of those ones I just covered is the most important? Well, it's really hard to say, and it's different in each situation. So what you really want to look for is a beacon interaction, all right? So it's the first interaction that provides sufficient indication of intent. All right, that's a really long statement that just says, you're really sure they're about to do something, and you're going to respond to that. So the definition of a beacon is a fire or light set up on a high or prominent position as a warning, signal, or celebration. And we're using in this term the concept of a signal. It's the user alerting you that they're doing something, and you can respond to it in a certain way. So these are some beacons. These are concrete interactions. If someone clicked the next button on a slideshow widget, for instance, you know that they're interacting with the slideshow. They expect page two to show up, um, potentially three, four, five, and 10. And they're expecting these things to work that way. So that's a concrete indication. Uh, mouse down on a, uh, or, or touch start on a draggable element is an indication that they want to drag it. Um, so make sure at that point you have it set up, that time or before. Clicking on a contact us link, again, we mentioned this earlier. These are all concrete beacons that say, hey, the very next thing that's going to happen is, is this, and you can, can anticipate it. So then you have probability-based indications. These are the ones where you enter the input field, and we're like, well, they're there. They're probably going to want to use the form. Let's get everything ready to go. Uh, again, the wizard I mentioned, a mousing over a draggable element. All of these are, you're, you're trying to judge. You're like, OK, I think they might be wanting to use this. Um, same thing with scrolling to the bottom of a page. They might want to interact with that form. At this point, there's no harm in setting it up. Let's go ahead and do it. 
So let's talk about a real example. We've given a lot of philosophy, a lot of ideas, a lot of bits and pieces. So let's look at this slideshow. Um, it's not really, let's assume that it's smaller than this on a real website. Um, so our slideshow example here is we're going to have, you know, any number, n number of slides, and there's going to be next and left arrows. It's not, gonna, it's not a carousel. It's not going to automatically go through these things. It's a slideshow. They're going to have to interact with it. Um, so we have three or four of these per page. We've got this really cool photography portfolio site we're working on. Uh, and we want to make this, you know, adhere to these principles we're learning today. Um, so the first way we might approach this is we have uh, something with a class of slideshow and some uh, UL in here with a class of slides. And we're like, all right, we've got a list of slides here. There's links around the images. And this goes on, you know, to as many slides as you have. Which is fine. This is a typical way to set it up. And then when Dom ready, you say, hey, I'm going to call my fancy slideshow plugin, and we're ready to go. Off to the races. So every single page they hit, now you're going to be setting up that and potentially wrapping each of those elements in additional elements, setting up, adding your arrows. And it's, it's a high expense um, for people that may or may not interact with certain parts of your page. So let's look how we could refactor this, how we could do this differently. One thing I would do is I'd, I'd afford myself, I'd put a little money up front, again, code, I'd put a little code up front that says, let's put my navigation in place here ahead of time. So I'm going to put it in here with my classes I'm expecting. I'll have the first one disabled and the, the next one not disabled. Um, so I put this in ahead of time. So now I've added bandwidth, right? But I'm going to be able to use a very little bit of HTML to leverage this new, this new thing that we're doing. So in this particular case, uh, I'm going to use this syntax. Sorry, it's on so many lines. It actually fits larger, but you know I meant to zoom in so everyone could read these better. Is that better? All right. You could have yelled at me, you know. That would have been acceptable. But sorry about that. All right. So I broke it so it would be able to do this. Um, so in this case, we're listening for a click event on some element that has a class of slideshow. And again, we're using a single initialization pattern um, that says um, that it doesn't have a class of slideshow ready. And then the, where that's kind of our scope for the parent, and then we're looking for this next slide. So what we've done is we've given a very specific rule that says in these situations, on any of these widgets, not any one particular one, on any of these widgets, if that next slide button is clicked, um, now instead of setting the slideshow up at the beginning, I'm just listening for that one event. When it happens, I'm going to first um, find the slideshow. I'm going to find its, its apparent element. So I'm going to find the closest slideshow so I have a re reference to it. I'm going to go ahead and initialize it. And remember, they just click next. So not only am I going to initialize it, I'm going to go ahead and advance that to the next piece. So you might say, well, what about the, you know, the slides are showing up wrong because the JavaScript's not there yet? Again, move as much as you can to the CSS um, to handle that initial state of your page. So you can handle a lot of that with the CSS so it shows up correctly to begin with. So now we have a situation where none of those elements that are there are actually interactive until they, they interact with it themselves and they click on next, at which point you can set that up. So this is just a, an example of something you can do. But again, we used a beacon event. We listened for that initial click. It's the first way. It's the only way they can basically interact with that element to start. The other button's disabled. So we have a really clear point of entry that we can then use and in, in leverage. So now you're in a situation where you have, oh, great. At, at one time, I knew by the time the page was done rendering, everything was ready to go. Now how do I manage the initialization? So there's a bunch of patterns. We're going to cover just the basic ones today. Um, there's more advanced ones using deferreds and a finite state machine uh, that are really fun for more advanced apps. Finite state machine works great with backbone type applications. Um, but let's talk about the basic patterns quickly. Uh, just a simple flag. So in this case, I outside my event, I bind a flag. You notice I'm still finding an element. I'm running a selection, which we're trying to talk about not doing. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and find this contact us element. When you click on it, if dialog is not populated, that's what the uh, not, you know, the, the bang, I think is what it's called. <laughs> Brain dump there. All right, anyway, it's going to say the not operator there, and it's going to reverse it. So if it doesn't exist, it's going to go ahead and find that and set up a dialog on it. If it does exist, it's going to hit that else statement and just go ahead and open the dialog. So the first time you click the button, it sets up the dialog. The second time you click the button, after they've closed it, it just opens the dialog. So that's like the simplest one-time initialization. You can use a jQuery 1 method. So you have, again, sim similar concept, except this time I'm going to go ahead and set it with a, a single event. So the first time this click is fired, it's going to fire the top one first. It's going to set up that dialog, and the second one's going to open it. And basically, it's going to unbind that first event. So then the second time it's clicked, there's no event to, to set it up, and it just opens. I don't use this one really much at all, but you may find situations where you have one-off stuff that might be helpful with this. So then we get to class name based. And you know. <laughs> There's caveats with maintaining state in the DOM. But in this particular case, 
um, we're going to be adding a class called is ready. So when you, um, on mouse enter the slideshow, if it's not ready, I'm going to go ahead and add the class of is ready. But in there where it says code, that's where you'd actually set it up. So that's class name based. This one here, class and delegation, this is my favorite. This is the one we've been showing today a couple times. Basically, you make your delegated event only match what you need when it's not set up. So in this case, I say if I've clicked in the slideshow and it's not, ha doesn't have a class of is ready. So as long as it doesn't have a class of is ready, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to match this and I'm going to fire the callback. In that callback, I set it up and I add the class. Now, again, jQuery UI adds classes all the time. So you can generally just leverage the classes it already has if you're using a widget or something from there. But in this case, we're just going to explicitly add an additional class. The nice thing about this is now the delegation handle is never firing this again. We don't have to worry about it ever double initializing because it, it doesn't need to happen. It's, it's already ruled it out. All right. So I've rushed a little bit. We're going to take time for just a couple questions. That's what the questions are for. And then I have a, a special thing I want to show right towards the end. So we have about three or so minutes for questions. Is there anything I can answer for you? Yeah. So the question was, um, what's more efficient, using uh, the sizzle selector type of concept there that I had? Let's go back to the example real quick, where it said colon not, and it's all part of the selector. Is that faster or is it better to just listen for the click and filter it by running an a internal statement? Um, so to, to answer your question, it's going to depend on a couple things. Depend on the type of application you're building. If the type of application you're building is a game and there's thousands of click events while they're interacting, or tap events while they're interacting with your game, then that could potentially be inefficient. But it's going to still be more efficient than hitting your callback every time and manually checking if the class is there. Like I, I, I have to, I don't have a JS perf I can link you to that says that exact thing. But the having less code, and it's also easier to, to understand what's happening. There's, it, it just won't fire again. But I don't know if that answers your question. It does depend on how much they interact with your page. Most people don't click all around a page 15 times. It'll especially on multi-page apps, they're off the page after just a short amount of time. A single page applications, it just depends on, on what they're doing. And the question was, if we have multiple blocks of document ready, will that affect the performance? Um, it's, it's, it's more of a maintenance thing. That's normally why you would have that split up that way. If you could consolidate it and it's all in the same file, that, that I would do that. But if it's for maintenance and it's separate, I wouldn't. I would look to focus on what's in that, what's running in each of those document readies, and see if that can be moved off to a later initialization. The exciting thing I want to show you tonight is a preview, uh, or this afternoon, is a preview of what the new jQuery designs are going to look like. Um, so a while ago, I started the work effort on this. Since then, um, Darcy Clark, a number of people in the jQuery team, uh, the jQuery board, and a bunch of volunteers last night have been working on this. Um, another group that we've been, um, that's done a ton of work on the inside interior of the pages is 47 Media, um, Jonathan Longnecker and Nate Croft. Um, and so this is a culmination we were, um, of what we're working on and what we'll be launching in the next couple weeks. So let me just go ahead and switch over here. To give you an idea, we're trying to, this is, it's, it's, this is a comp, so it's not responsive or anything. That's why there's white on the side. Um, but we're trying to unify all of our sites um, so there's a, a global navigation that will let you quickly jump between our primary projects, which are, um, J, this is kind of small up at the top there, especially people in the back. But the jQuery, jQuery UI, jQuery mobile, they can then open up and display all the projects, see more information about those. The stuff will be consistent. Right now, you're on jQuery UI. JQuery UI and you click on blog, it's going to take you one place. But if you're another part of the site, click blog, it might take you somewhere else. Um, so this is all to unify across the sites. Um, the, the outer frame, the entire site's responsive, so it does scale down to mobile devices. Um, and that works really well. Um, jQuery, let's see here. Uh, jQuery UI, again, we have a consistent feel, look and feel throughout the sites. Um, so they all have different color coding, and they all work that way. Uh, and then um, the one I'm really excited about is the jQuery plugin site. And so this will be, I think, the primary focus of probably the first site to get the, the new design. Um, but it's going to have this incredible new look. Um, it has information. You can fork it. You can see the ac GitHub activity. Um, and again, all of this is going to be just responsive. And we're trying to set, um, set an example for how sites should be built and, and again, have that type of um, quality you'd expect from the jQuery project. Um, so really excited to see this coming through. Um, in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to help with this, talk to Richard, talk to Adam, talk to, to the jQuery team about volunteering, because there's still a lot of work to do. The designs are almost done, um, but there's still a lot of implementation. So we made progress last night, but there's a lot more to do. Um, so this is what you can expect to see in the next couple of weeks from the project. And with that, I'm over time. So thank you very much.